Okay. So Dr. Alisa Griffin is an assistant professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences and the principal investigator of the Coastal Health and Near Shore Geochemistry Lab and the University of California in Davis and the Bodega Marine Laboratory. She received her bachelor's and her master's degrees in geology from Temple University and she has also a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. And she's interested in the cycling of carbon and related elements in coastal marine ecosystems and using science to build climate resiliency and in and the resource coastal community. Dr. Griffin is deeply committed to creating a more equitable, just and inclusive future for the next generation of geoscientists and for her work. She has received multiple honors, including the UC San Diego Inclusive Excellence Award, the induction into the Bouchet Honor Society, and the UC Davis Chancellor for Doctoral Fellowship. And today she's going to talk to us about marine sediments in changing climate, unlocking the past, and preparing for the future. So thank you so much for being here with us, Alisa, and please go ahead. Thank you so much for thank having me, and thanks to everyone who was able to make it live. Um, and anyone watching the recording hereafter. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, as I was told, um, you know, I thought it'd be helpful to start with a little bit more about myself, my research interests, and sort of my career trajectory. Um, so I am one of the few folks you could probably find who ended up in marine biogeochemistry uh, but actually started college as a music major. Um, so I was training to be uh, an opera singer um, and I took a geology class and I absolutely fell in love with it. And the rest is history, as they say. Um, so I'm interested in how rocks interact with seawater and marine environments. And so that's really what led me uh, ultimately into oceanography. So really, I'm a geologist and chemical oceanographer by training. And what I'm interested in is how elements are transformed and cycled within marine environments, which is also known as marine biogeochemistry. Uh, and just as the name suggests, biogeochemical processes and cycles are influenced to varying degrees by biological, geological, and chemical interactions, which occur on various spatiotemporal scales. And because the oceans are such a significant component of our planet, marine biogeochemistry plays a really important role in local as well as global biogeochemical cycles. Oop. I think we'd be better at this by now. <laughs> um, so understanding uh, marine biogeochemical processes is increasingly important as uh, human-induced alterations to our planet continue to accelerate. Uh, the ocean continues to be perturbed by anthropogenic pollution, including nutrient and sediment inputs, and of course, carbon. So uh, perhaps some of you recognize this graph, um, but this graph is known as the Keeling curve after Charles David Keeling, who uh, first started carbon dioxide measurements in our atmosphere. And so on the y-axis, it shows increasing carbon dioxide uh, since measurements first began in 1958 along the x-axis. And the first time I ever even thought about the climate, uh, again, I was a music major who took a geology course, uh, to be honest, because I heard it was easy. Um, but I was immediately humbled by thinking about planetary processes and climate and geologic time um, because I was fascinated that humans, as insignificant as we are, could cause global scale changes in the Earth system. So currently atmospheric CO2 is uh, right around um, 420 ppm with some oscillation. Um, and we know that in order to avoid the most uh, catastrophic consequences of climate change, we not only need to aggressively curb our emissions, but eventually we need to reach net negative global emissions. So we actually have to find ways to actively remove carbon from the atmosphere. 
Um, I personally believe that climate change is one of the most pressing environmental issues of our time. And my research continues to be driven by the desire to better understand our climate system, uh, climate system uh, assess present climatic changes, and hopefully build resilience and mitigate future climate consequences for all people. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's when I first started thinking about climate. <laughs> um, so if we take a broad look at the global carbon cycle, we know that anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide or CO2 from fossil fuels and land use changes um, are leading to an excess of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and subsequent climate change. However, what many folks don't know is that approximately 30% of this excess carbon dioxide is actually absorbed by the ocean annually, where it can be uh, cycled in many different ways and ultimately is deposited as marine sediments. And so I like to say without the ocean, we'd we, it all already be over. The ocean is really saving us here. Um, so once carbon dioxide enters the ocean, if we examine uh, what happens to it once it enters the ocean in more detail, uh, we know that the carbon is used in two primary ways. So the first one is for photosynthesis. Um, so using carbon dioxide, water, and of course, uh, light to produce organic matter in the surface ocean. Or carbon can also be used by organisms to precipitate uh, carbonate minerals as their structural and protective hard parts using uh, calcium ions and carbonate ions, which contain carbon in seawater. Carbon then accumulates in marine sediments when these inorganic shells and skeletons, as well as organic carbon particles, settle out of the water column and are deposited on the seafloor. And through this mechanism, carbon is eventually buried in marine sediments and removed from the atmosphere over geologic timescales. So this is kind of like the end of the road for atmospheric carbon. This is really the ultimate sink over geologic time. So I study marine sediments because, again, they're really this ultimate sink of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And therefore, marine sedimentation is a fundamental control of ocean chemistry, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, and in turn, Earth's climate. Uh, additionally, much of our climatic records are contained in ancient marine sediments. And so understanding how carbon is cycled in the modern environment could help us unlock past information contained in those rocks and help us better predict our future. Oop, keep forgetting, I got animations. <laughs> so um, these overarching ideas and thoughts are really uh, what have led me to investigate some really broad research questions um, that I'll be touching on today. So the first is what role do marine sediments play in local and global cycling of carbon and related elements? What controls biogeochemical processes related to carbon in marine sediments from the very, very small micro scale to the macro scale? And one thing I'm really passionate about, can we leverage the natural processing and storage and fluxes of sedimentary carbon in the ocean to help mitigate future climate scenarios? So I'll address these questions uh, within the following contexts. So first I'll discuss microscale properties of biogenic minerals and their dissolution rates and how these minerals are cycled in marine environments. Then I'll zoom out a little bit and uh, talk about the ecosystem scale. So how the dissolution of carbonate minerals in coral reef sediments may change under future climate scenarios and what that means for reef health. And then lastly, I'll talk about the uh, importance of carbon cycling and storage in seagrass and other nearshore ecosystems. And lastly, Deeply interwoven with my work is my own journey and efforts to build a more equitable and inclusive future for climate research. And so I'll share some insights from my experiences uh, working with uh, community-led partnerships uh, to build uh, climate resiliency in coastal communities. 
And these little icons will be in the type right, the top right corner throughout the talk to, to keep, keep you, help keep you uh, on track. All right, so now that we have a plan, let's get into it. So in order to talk about um, biogenic carbonate dissolution, we first have to talk about biomineralization. So biomineralization is the formation of minerals by organisms. Um, and when organisms precipitate minerals, they can heavily influence the geochemistry of marine tests, shells, skeletons, and in turn, our interpretations of the geochemistry in the rock record. Um, biominerals are very diverse and can be uh, silicate-based like diatoms and radiolaria, these tiny little plankton. Um, they can be phosphate-based like fish bones and teeth. Um, or carbonate base, such as nacre or mother of pearl, which is, you know, that beautiful material that makes up abalone shells and pearls. Um, and another fun fact, we're all biomineralizers. So you precipitate bones and teeth, and that's a calcium phosphate mineral. And so even as uh, I speak, we're all biomineralizing. Um, but the most widespread and abundant biogenic mineral uh, in the ocean is calcium carbonate. And all of the marine organisms pictured here make some form of calcium carbonate mineral, again, as their structural or protective hard parts. And that includes microscopic plankton, um, various types of shellfish that are critical protein sources around the world, and also just really tasty, uh, and fund and foundational species such as corals that support some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. So all of these biomineralizers extremely important to uh, various marine ecosystems. So in the modern ocean, marine calcifiers are actually responsible for the majority of marine carbonate production. Um, the, this production and ultimate accumulation of carbonate is known as the oceanic carbonate pump. And as we've already established, it's a very integral major component of the global carbon cycle. What's interesting though, is that in the oceanic carbonate pump, way more carbonate is produced than is accumulated on the seafloor. And what this means is that approximately 80% of carbonates that are produced are dissolved somewhere as they sink through the ocean or through the water column, or once they reach uh, the ocean seafloor. So this means that carbonate dissolution is a very, very important geochemical process in the ocean. Um, so let's take a step back for <laughs> a second. Um, carbonate dissolution, what do I mean when I say that? Um, carbonate dissolution, you can liken it to uh, this figure here of a cube of some unknown material, maybe sugar, uh, dissolving in water into dissolved ions. And we use the chemical equation here to represent the movement of a solid calcium carbonate mineral dissolving into separate calcium and carbonate ions. Um, there, it's important to note there are multiple types of carbonates in the ocean, including calcite, aragonite, and magnesium calcite. Um, they all have slightly different physical and chemical properties that cause them to be more or less soluble or more or less likely to dissolve in the marine environment. In addition to different types of carbonate minerals, we also have minerals that are formed through abiotic processes and those that are formed by organisms. And what we see is that carbonates that are formed by organisms tend to have much more complex surfaces, which leads to higher adsorption rates, which means they can incorporate more things into their mineral uh, structure. They tend to have an organic matrix associated with them. So just like your bones, I don't know if anybody has ever broken a bone, but, um, you know, bone tends to be somewhat pliable. Um, it's not, you know, rock solid. And that's because it has an organic template on which the uh, calcium phosphate bone deposits on. So many biogenic minerals um, have that same characteristic. That organic matrix tends to make the mineral less crystalline. So again, a little more pliable, um, which means that different elements can be incorporated into the minerals differently. 
So I'm bringing this up because whether a mineral is biogenic or abiotic, even if it's the same exact type chemically of carbonate mineral, you might have those two types of minerals um, interact with seawater in very different ways because of these different properties. All right, so um, there are carbonates distributed across many marine environments, but some budgets suggest that nearly 50% of marine carbonates accumulate in shallow marine environments and that these shallow carbonates might represent um, over 70% of the carbonates that we see in the rock record. So this means that geologically, many of the inferences that we make from these preserved carbonates about global climate change and past seawater chemistry rely on interpretations of geochemical signatures contained in um, shallow carbonates. Um, however, these interpretations often require the assumption that major physical and chemical changes do not occur after the mineral is deposited. Those types of changes are known as diagenesis. And while that assumption might be appropriate in deeper uh, ocean sediments, we know for a fact that shallow carbonate sediments undergo daily cycles of photosynthesis and respiration which take up and release carbon dioxide respectively. And that happens every single day over, over, over and over again. And what this means for the carbonate minerals is that um, these daily changes in carbon dioxide levels in the sediments are responsible for driving daily cycles in carbonate uh, precipitation and dissolution dynamics. So typically photosynthesis and precipitation are dominant processes during the day. So we're drawing down CO2 and making more carbon. We'll edit that part out, I guess, <laughs> in the recording. <laughs> um, all right. So um, we were talking about these diol cycles of carbon dioxide uptake and release. And so again, during the day, we have the drawdown of CO2 and precipitation of carbonates. And at night, we have um, the release of CO2 through respiration, which then drives carbonate dissolution. And we can actually uh, measure these cycles in the sediments through two chemical parameters. So uh, one is dissolved inorganic carbon. And so when carbonates are precipitated or dissolved, it changes the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon in the seawater. And then the second, one is a little trickier to understand. It's called total alkalinity, but essentially it's the neutralizing capacity of seawater. Um, and it's related to the amount of negatively charged ions in seawater, the primary ones I've listed in this equation. And you can see that the carbonate ion is included there. And so carbonate mineral precipitation and dissolution also influences alkalinity. Um, so changes in dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity due to photosynthesis and respiration, as well as carbonate dynamics, can lead to chemical gradients between the sediments and the overlying seawater. Um, this results in fluxes of both dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity across the sediment water interface. And by measuring these fluxes, we can actually uh, start to disentangle the biogeochemical processes that are occurring within the sediments themselves. And so using this approach, we can uh, start to answer some of the outstanding questions in uh, carbonate dynamics uh, in the ocean. So uh, first, which carbonate mineral phases are actually precipitating and dissolving? So I mentioned there's many different types of carbonate minerals um, and we don't have a good understanding of which uh, minerals are preferentially participating in these different reactions. Um, the second one is not only understanding what phases are dissolving, but understanding what the controls are on the likelihood of different minerals to dissolve. This is known as their apparent solubility. And so um, our lab uses a wide range of both laboratory and field-based experimental approaches and geochemical tools um, to try to answer these unresolved questions. Um, 
And I'm going to skip over the first question just for the sake of time uh, and really focus on this second question. What controls the apparent solubility, again, the likelihood of a carbonate mineral to dissolve? All right. So as I mentioned, um, biogenic carbonate minerals tend to be very different from their abiotic counterparts. Uh, so this is an SEM. Uh, these are SEM images I took of two carbonate grains from the same sediment sample. So imagine scooping up uh, a handful of sand at the beach and looking at two individual grains. That's what you're looking at here. And what you can see is I have two very different organisms. So on the left, I have a what we call a benthic foraminifera, and on the right, a super teeny tiny uh, gastropod. And this really high variability at this scale makes it very difficult to attribute larger scale processes to any microscopic characteristics in natural sediments. Um, despite this challenge though, uh, all carbonate minerals are expected to follow widely accepted paradigms of carbonate dissolution, which state that um, Dissolution should increase with increasing pCO2 uh, or increasing CO2 or decreasing pH, um, decreasing grain size, and decreasing mineral stability. However, I wanted to explicitly test these paradigms in shallow carbonate sediments. So um, to do this, uh, I measured the dissolution rates of well-characterized carbonate sediments from the Bermuda and Heron Island uh, Australia carbonate platforms in a controlled laboratory setting uh, using the reactor pictured here. And I'd be happy to talk about this reactor in more detail if anyone's interested. Um, so this work was done with the help of uh, three undergraduate students, uh, Morgan Goodrich, Sam Kekweva, uh, and Ralph Torres, all pictured here, who uh, all of whom are now PhD students. Um, and the results of our experiments are pictured here. And as anticipated, the dissolution rate on the y-axis um, increases as the partial pressure of CO2 increases on the x-axis. Um, however, we found no correlation between the measured dissolution rates and the grain size or mineralogy of the sediment samples as is an expected paradigm of carbonate dissolution. However, what we did find out of all the physical and chemical characteristics we analyzed in these samples, um, the only significant correlations we found were with increasing dissolution, or sorry, with increasing dissolution rates, um, were with decreasing percent of organic carbon and decreasing delta 13C signature of that organic content. So I'm gonna walk through one possible explanation for these trends, which could be related to organic mineral interactions. Uh, so like many biogenic minerals, again, your bones being a great example, biogenic carbonates have that organic template that's tightly bound to the crystal structure. And that material is known as intracrystalline organic matter. Um, in addition, it's been shown that organic molecules can absorb or attach themselves to the surfaces of biogenic carbonates. And this is referred to as non-intracrystalline organic matter. And it's been previously suggested that these um, organic coatings may act as a, oh, may act as a protective barrier, sorry about that, may act as a protective um, barrier around sediment grains and inhibit the direct interaction of seawater with the mineral surface, thus influencing their reaction rates. So in order to test that hypothesis, what we can do is remove this adsorbed organic coatings um, by oxidizing it in bleach, and this removes only the adsorbed organic matter without altering the mineral surface or intracrystalline organics. And sure enough, when we measure the dissolution rates of, um, of grains where this organic coating has been removed, um, the dissolution rates were approximately two to three times higher 
uh, for sediment samples with varying amounts of total organic carbon. And so um, these experiments could explain the trend that we see in total organic carbon and dissolution. But recall that we also saw this isotopic trend where dissolution rates increased when the delta 13C of the organic carbon decreased or became lighter. So to get at this question, I determined the isotopic signatures um, of the intracrystalline versus non-intracrystalline organic matter. And once I did so, this trend started to make sense. So um, the adsorbed or non-intracrystalline organic matter has a significantly heavier signature of negative 11.8 per mil relative to the intracrystalline matrix which has a signature of negative 13.8 per mil. So this suggests that as non-intracrystalline organic matter decreases on the grain surface, the overall signature would become lighter and more similar to the intracrystalline organic matter. So now if we put all of this together, if you're still with me, uh, we can now explain both trends in the organic matter data. So you can imagine that as organic matter is removed from the surface, the total percent of organic carbon decreases and is removed from the surface, um, shown by the orange axis on the left. This removal of the non-crystalline non organic carbon also results in the overall isotopic signature becoming lighter as well. But now, as we remove that coating, more mineral surface is exposed to the surrounding seawater, and this increases the dissolution rates, um, as you see on the x-axis. So now this has all come together, um, and we've shown this across two completely different uh, carbonate systems. So all of these findings really support the hypothesis that um, these bio, that biogenic dissolution rates uh, decrease in the presence of these organic matter coatings on the surface of grains uh, because mineral surfaces are unable to directly interact with surrounding seawater. So who cares? Why does this matter? <laughs> um, well, this challenges some of these really long held assumptions about carbonate dissolution. And in turn, for all the reasons I've already mentioned, the cycling and geochemistry of carbonates in marine environments, as well as the global carbon cycle. So now if we um, zoom out a little bit to uh, the ecosystem scale, uh, we just showed that we can anticipate carbonate mineral dissolution to increase with increasing PCO2. Um, but what does this have to do with the ocean? Well, as I mentioned at the top of the talk, hopefully this red line looks familiar from a few slides ago, um, atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing due to anthropogenic emissions, which has been docu documented um, and is shown here in red. So it shows increasing carbon dioxide on the y-axis over time on the x-axis. And as atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, again, approximately 30% is absorbed by the ocean annually, which causes carbon dioxide levels in the ocean, shown here in blue. Let me see if I can get my cursor on the right screen. Here we go. Shown here in blue um, to increase as well. And this uptake results in a series of chemical reactions that lower the pH of the ocean, seen here in green, and also lower the amount of carbonate ions in seawater. And all of these processes together lowered seawater carbonate ions and lowered saturation state, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, are collectively referred to as ocean acidification. So this is the first time I've talked about saturation state. So I just want to take a quick moment to define it. Um, saturation state determines how likely carbonate minerals are to precipitate or dissolve. Um, when saturation state is greater than one or super saturated, we expect uh, minerals to form or precipitate. And when it's less than one or under saturated, we expect them to dissolve. For now, all I want you to remember for those that are not familiar with these terms is that as saturation state decreases, 
we anticipate this to shift this equilibrium equation towards dissolution. So the lower your saturation state, the more likely you are to dissolve these minerals. So um, collectively, ocean acidification is expected to increase the dissolution of carbonate minerals. And this has led to concerns for the health of marine calcifiers who, again, make their protective and structural hard parts completely out of carbonate. Um, and although, as I mentioned before, there are many calcifiers in the ocean that may be influ influenced by this uh, changing carbonate chemistry, uh, perhaps the uh, response of coral reefs to ocean acidification has received um, the most significant attention. And this is because reefs support biodiversity and coastal communities around the world, but they're also composed almost entirely of carbonate minerals. In fact, um, because reefs are made almost entirely of carbonates, we can think of them more generally as the balance of carbonate production and destruction. And we often refer to this balance as net community calcification or NCC, um, because reefs are an ecological community. So um, when NCC is positive, this is the same as reef growth, and it can only occur when the production of calcium carbonate outpaces its destruction via dissolution. So you can really think about this like a, like a bank account, right? You're putting more money than you're taking out. You're going to have uh, a bank account in the green. But if you're like me and you're terrible at that um, <laughs> and you're taking out more than you're putting in, you're going to have a net loss. And so negative NCC represents just that. We're losing more carbonate than we're creating. And ocean acidification is expected to decrease net community calcification on reefs around the world. And some recent studies have actually uh, suggested that lowered surface seawater saturation state could lead... Um, could cause uh, reefs to shift into a state of net dissolution or negative NCC by the end of this century. However, um, we don't know if that shift to negative NCC is going to be caused by decreases in calcification or decreases in production or increases in dissolution. Um, Studies uh, to this, uh, recent studies have uh, suggested that dissolution uh, is uh, influencing this shift more than calcification, but so far studies have disproportionately focused on biological calcification and production. Um, and this is really interesting given that experimentally it's been suggested that dissolution may be 10 times more sensitive to ocean acidification than coral calcification. In addition to um, ocean acidification uh, showing uh, decreased NCC at the ecosystem scale, other work has also shown that if we uh, increase or reverse ocean acidification, uh, increase alkalinity or reverse ocean acidification, that NCC rates actually increase. But again, we don't know how these individual processes are responsible for these ecosystem changes. So um, the individual processes contributing to NCC, such as calcification, precipitation, dissolution, are occurring across the entire reef. But it's important to note that within the reef system, up to 95% of reefs can be made up of sediments. Um, so it's important that we look at the reefs and the organisms calcifying on the reef, but we also need to look at what's happening in the coral sediments to have a more holistic picture of what's happening to the reef over time. So in order to uh, study the carbonate dynamics of reef sediments, I went to uh, Lizard Island, Australia, uh, which is located along the Great Barrier Reef, about 30 kilometers from Queensland, and uh, conducted field experiments at four contrasting sites all around the southern shore of Lizard Island. 
So I mentioned before that we can actually measure the biogeochemical fluxes across the sediment water interface, and we can use those fluxes to parse apart different uh, biogeochemical processes happening within the sediments. And so I've included this little video just to just to show you what this looks like in practice. Um, but that's me <laughs> uh, there on uh, scuba. And essentially, we put these uh, chambers onto the seafloor to incubate the sediment. Um, and we can sample the chamber incubations using syringes, uh, which you see here. So we pull the water out of the chamber, and then we take those syringes back uh, to the surface and to the lab to be analyzed for uh, relevant parameters such as dissolved inorganic carbon, total alkalinity, et cetera. Um, the chambers extend about 20 centimeters into the uh, into the sea floor. Um, and advection into the sediments and out of the sediments is induced by this little spinning acrylic disc uh, that hopefully you all see here. So using these chambers, um, we measured changes in dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity over time, uh, over 24 hour cycles. So we sampled them uh, at dawn, at dusk and at dawn to get to characterize the changes at night, as well as the changes during the day. In addition, we also acidified some of the chambers to represent future ocean acidification conditions and we also added alkalinity um, to achieve um, to achieve past conditions or, or alkalinity enhanced conditions. So before I show you the results, I just want to orient you here a little bit. Um, so on the left, we have the net community production rates. Um, so that's organic carbon. And on the right, we have the calcification rates or NCC. Um, and then our acidified treatments are in red, the controls are in green, and the uh, few, uh, past conditions or alkalinity and rich conditions are in purple. The more faded um, colors are the nighttime rates, the bold are the daytime rates, and the um, bottom panel is just the integrated 24 hour rates. And so I'm gonna breeze through this a little bit because I know I'm, Oh, doing not doing super great on time. <laughs> um, but uh, what we see in these results is that there is no significant difference in that community production across the three different treatments. So there was no significant difference, and that suggests that photosynthesis and respiration are not influenced by changes in ocean carbonate chemistry. However, the net community calcification rates show very show a very different story. So across all sites, we see that nighttime net community calcification rates um, uh, were significantly different under the different treatments with lower NCC rates under acidified conditions and higher NCC rates under alkalinity in rich conditions relative to the present or control conditions. However, we didn't see that during the day. We saw that NCC rates in the daytime were higher under alkalinity and rich conditions, but interestingly, there was no significant difference in NCC rates during, uh, under the acidified treatments. And so what this suggests is that perhaps there's some additional mechanism uh, that's tempering changes during the day to acidification, such as um, bio biological calcification. Um, so uh, it's been shown that many organisms can control the chemical conditions near their calcifying surfaces. And so potentially that's what's happening during the day, whereas at night, we're just seeing, uh, we're just seeing dissolution, which is only a thermodynamic process has nothing to do with organisms. And so this could explain the differences that we see between night and day. I think what's most important in this figure though, is that all of the 24 hour rates when integrated over day and night uh, showed net negative NCC. So we're losing carbonate material over um, the daily cycle and um, because we don't see those differences during the day, that means that this nighttime 
uh, this nighttime dissolution is really what's responsible for transitioning the sediments from net calcifying to net dissolving. And so all of this just goes to show that dissolution, again, may be more sensitive to changes in ocean carbonate chemistry than biological calcification. And this matters because uh, if our outputs, again, think of the bank account, if our outputs are greater than our inputs, then we would anticipate a net loss of these critically important ecosystems. So I know I'm getting very close on time. So I'm just going to breeze through the last little bit. So hopefully we can, you know, chat about things other than carbonates. <laughs> um, so I just want to touch on some of the work we do in other nearshore ecosystems. So um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term blue carbon, but just like forests on land that store carbon in their soils and their biomass, um, there are vegetated aquatic ecosystems that also store carbon uh, in the same way. It just so happens that those soils are sediments that are underwater. And what I want you to see on this plot is that relative to boreal forest or tropical forests on land, these ecosystems such as seagrasses, salt marshes, mangroves are orders of magnitude more efficient at storing carbon in uh, their ecosystem than terrestrial forests. And these systems are distributed all around the world um, with uh, our own coast here in California, right near the Bodega Marine Lab, having a uh, plentiful uh, seagrass ecosystems. And so my group uh, studies uh, how carbon is stored and transformed in these systems. So um, seagrasses can exist in all kinds of different environments, and they've been shown um, to influence sediments in many different ways. So they increase carbon deposition by decreasing wave energy and allowing things to uh, settle out of the water column. They um, stabilize underlying sediments and they bury and store carbon. They also limit resuspension so that sediments don't get kicked back up. Um, and they also introduce oxygen into the sediments through their extensive roots and rhizome systems. It's even been shown that they can enhance chemical cycling by uh, increasing microbial activity within the sediments. And all of these processes can significantly influence how carbon is cycled and stored within these ecosystems. And it can also influence those exchanges of carbon across the sediment water interface. So why do we care about this? Well, if we have a sedimentary system that's releasing total alkalinity into the overlying water, this is a potential way to capture more carbon um, from either seagrass metabolism or air-sea gas exchange. Also, if we are producing total alkalinity in these environments, um, that total alkalinity could then be transported, exported to the coastal ocean and allow for the open ocean to take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. And I'm, I'm, you know, not out of my mind when I share this with you because there are all kinds of folks um, studying this right now in terms of building climate resilience and mitigation strategies. So you can see right here, there's uh, ecosystem, there, sorry, there's alkalinity enhancement is one of the ways in which folks are talking about pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So finding different ways to increase the alkalinity of the ocean. And they're also talking about ecosystem restoration. Um, what I'm interested in is, can we merge these two approaches into one? And sure enough, a recent modeling paper came out that, su that suggested that ocean alkalinity enhancement could actually be achieved by restoring blue carbon ecosystems. And so currently my group is looking at how do alkalinity fluxes change in different seagrass environments? And what are the biogeochemical processes that control the flux of alkalinity into and out of seagrass systems? And so this work is led by my master's student, Liu McConan, um, and the rest of our team in the lab. Um, 
I think I I think I'm out of time, so I don't want to. Oh, it's I okay. Wanna... You you can go. It's okay. We have okay. time. <laughs> I just have one last section, and I'll make it fast. <laughs> So I do want to talk about the importance of um, community-led partners uh, and coastal climate resiliency. Um, so to contextualize this, um, I want to share that often there's very little overlap between who's most impacted by climate change, who's doing climate research, and who's making policy decisions related to climate. And this is due mostly in part to the lack of diversity among climate researchers and policymakers caused by the exclusionary practices in the way climate research and policymaking are conducted. And we know that these systems and practices exclude the very people who will be most impacted by climate change, which we know are Black and Indigenous peoples, communities of color, women, and low-income populations. And so I just wanted to take some time to highlight um, a few community-led partnerships that I've co-generated and have the privilege of participating in. Um, so the first is through uh, the American Geophysical Union's Thriving Earth Exchange, which is a project to uh, develop a risk assessment report for a proposed limestone mine on the island of North Andros. Um, this project is led by a group of local fly fishermen and the Bahamas Agricultural and Marine Science Institute. And they're very concerned with the potential impacts of the installation of a mine on the uh, island's natural resources. And then the second partnership is uh, with a community-led environmental justice organization called Green Action. Um, so this project was right in our own backyard, um, looking uh, at uh, legacy contaminants from the decommissioned Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco Bay. Um, so this work is in collaboration with Hunters Point Biomonitoring Program, uh, which continues to identify disproportionate health issues and cancer clusters in the surrounding neighborhood of Bayview, uh, which is predominantly a low-income community of color. Um, and so I just wanted to share these very briefly because I think there are ways in which we all can be very creative about how we use our science and service uh, to uh, communities and spread the wealth of resources that we all have access to, to through our positions. Um, the more recent partnership I'm working with is with uh, Marin City Climate Resilience and Health Justice. And so we are assessing storm and drinking water quality um, through Marin City. So this picture in the bottom right shows what happens pretty much every time it rains in Marin City. So the whole community becomes flooded and residents are unable to access um, their own homes and have to wade through these knee to waist deep waters with who knows what, uh, you know, inside of it. And so uh, this winter, as these as storms continue to pick up, we're going to go and uh, analyze some of these storm waters. Um, lastly, uh, as a researcher, you know, I really strive to use my privilege to increase accessibility and inclusion within climate science research. Um, maybe some of you don't know this because I know uh, you all are outside of the geosciences, um, but the geosciences are actually the least diverse um, field among all of the STEM fields. And this paper came out a, a few years ago um, that shows that the geosciences have made very little progress in the last 40 years towards uh, a more diverse community. And currently less than 5% of all geoscience degree recipients in the US are women of color and less than 1% of geoscience faculty are women of color. Um, but as a woman of color and a faculty member in the geosciences, um, I don't really need the statistics to tell me that. Um, it's something that I and all of those who came before me have experienced and continue to experience firsthand. Uh, and when you're the first or the only in the room, uh, it leads you to really question your belonging. Um, and that's not a good feeling. So uh, I try really hard to not just hold the door open behind me, but really to just take the door right off the hinges. Um, and so two of the ways I've done that recently is um, I started a uh, scientific diving diversity fellowship program 
at my PhD institution, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And this is providing um, students, uh, under-resourced students with uh, resources to overcome barriers to participation in uh, both scientific and recreational uh, scuba diving. The second is a program that we just ran for the first time last summer. Um, it was funded through California Sea Grant, uh, and it provided research opportunities for incoming UC Davis transfer students in our marine and coastal science major, as well as our geology major um, and other related majors. And so we brought um, incoming transfer students out to Bodega Marine Lab and had them you know, do real uh, scientific research and get those opportunities before uh, even uh, transferring into UC Davis. And it was very successful and hopefully we'll find a way to fund it uh, in the future. Um, so why do I spend all this time broadening participation? Well, uh, I think that broadening participation in climate science really matters. I think we do our best science uh, when everyone is at the table. Um, there's a quote I really love from Dr. Brandon Jones, who's uh, in the geoscience directorate at NSF. And he often says in his talks, we're facing all hands on deck issues, but not all hands are on deck. And so um, I'd really like to encourage everyone uh, who's here or watching this recording to see how they can build bridges within and between their own professional and personal communities. Um, because I think the only way we're gonna really do anything about the climate crisis is if we do it together. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about me and my research group, um, this is our website here, um, the Coastal Health and Nearshore Geochemistry Lab, also known as the Change Lab. And I always like to end with my reason for doing this science, my, my kiddo, and hopefully all of our kiddos. So uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you, thank you so much. It was fantastic. Thank so you. do we have questions? Questions? Sure. I have a question. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, it's really nice work, really great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. The work you did on measuring net uh, carbon assimilation or calcification uh, when you modulated the pH I you know either make it more acidic or more basic what how much did you change the pH by in those experiments like how big was the pH change uh, in order to get the net negative um, you know calcification and how close are we to that degree of change yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I can't remember the exact value, but um, we in we decreased the pH by um, values that were reasonable for future scenarios. So end of century scenarios. Um, so probably somewhere within point one or a little less. Um, and we're very likely to to reach those scenarios. And so thinking about um, what that means for the reef, again, um, I like the, now I, I like to expand the bank account analogy and say you have two bank accounts, right? You have your coral reef bank account and you have your sediment bank account. And 95% of your money is in your sediment bank account and 5% is in your coral reef bank account. And so what we're seeing is that if the sediment where 95% of the total carbon is located is net loss or net losing, that means that the coral reef as a whole is losing carbonate and it can no longer accumulate uh, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Um, sure. How much... How much does temperature influence the different rates of acidification? And do you see differences kind of in the equator versus whether in California or the closer to the poles? Yeah, great question. Um, so there have been some, uh, so first of all, temperature is very important um, because temperature controls the solubility of carbon dioxide. And so um, your changes in carbonate chemistry are very much going to rely on the temperature. 
But another interesting thing we've seen, um, this paper came out maybe 2019, is that um, when you increase the temperature, you're also increasing the rates of respiration. And so with the temperature increase, you're getting not only, you know, changes in the overall seawater chemistry, but you're getting, more importantly, that release of carbon dioxide um, more not more rapidly, but you're getting more of a release of carbon dioxide because you have higher net respiration rates. And so that's really where we're seeing uh, temperature play a role because as that CO2 is released, then that's going to uh, drive dissolution further. Yeah, fun fact, carbonate minerals are one of the few minerals that actually are less soluble at higher temperatures. <laughs> So it doesn't matter as much for the for the geochemistry. It's more mm -hmm. that net respiration and dissolution coupling. So Alisa, you say that scientists are trying to make the oceans more alkaline, right? Yes. So what are the strategies that you use to do that? Yeah, there's a lot of strategies. So essentially, it involves any type of addition of alkalinity from outside of the ocean. Um, so people have suggested increasing the dissolution of carbonates because that releases alkalinity. Um, folks have looked at, uh, different types of additions. So different types of chemical additions. Um, a more recent paper actually looked at, um, adding those additions to sewage, uh, at, like, uh, I don't know what it's called, out waste or like, <laughs> effluent. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brain. Um, sewage effluent, um, and having that add um alkalinity to seawater. And so there, I mean, it's really just all kinds of things are really coming out. Um, everybody woke up one morning and was like, I'm a carbonate chemist. <laughs> and they're trying all kinds of all kinds of different approaches. Um, what I really like about the blue carbon approach is again, you're you're doing both of those things and you're leveraging a natural system that already has um, a bunch of ecosystem benefits associated with it um, in addition to the carbon storage. Uh, so rather than pulling something else in or altering the system, we're just we're just leveraging the efficiency of a natural process and system and sort of killing two birds with one stone. Okay. So you saw in the beginning this graphic where the carbon was increasing, right, with time. Uh -huh. so what, what is going to happen? Do, it's going to keep increasing or scientists are going to be able to balance the increase? What do you think? Yeah. Great question. Um, so the... Um... There are reports that come out every few years called the ICPP report, um, and they uh, they uh, show different scenarios of emissions. So they're known as emission scenarios, and it shows, you know, if we keep emitting CO2 the way we've been emitting it, what will it look like? If we took all of the fossil fuels out of the ground and burned them all at once, what would it look like? If we curbed our emissions or tried to make more efforts, what would it look like? Um, and unfortunately, most of those scenarios, aside from dramatic decreases, like shutting off CO2 tomorrow, um, show that we should anticipate drastic changes in, in global temperature. Um, and so this is why, uh, you know, folks are really focusing on how can we pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in addition to uh, finding ways to not emit so much in the first place? Because um, we know that if we don't actively pull the carbon out of the atmosphere, that there's really no chance for us to uh, avoid the worst case scenarios. Okay, thank you so much. So do we have more questions? Questions? Well so I have a, a question, maybe this is a follow-up from Veronica's first one about making the ocean more alkaline. And I admit that I'm um, very far from anything remotely resembling a scientist, so I may not fully understand 
the kind of the biggest picture of what you're talking about, but the idea is to sequester more carbon in the ocean, right? And some of it might be through that graphic you had with the little ant acid, like is like artificially injecting carbon into the ocean. Like my first thought, like my immediate thought was like the unexpected dangers of basically trying to manipulate a system as opposed to what you were saying, the blue, I'm sorry, I forget the second word, the the blue system where it's re restoring, right, the ocean's natural processes rather than trying to manipulate it. it. Sounds like the basis of a really bad movie, like in terms of the consequences, like yeah. what, what sort of um, dangers do you foresee in, in trying to artificially get the ocean to absorb more carbon that, you know, we just refuse to stop making? Yeah, so I think one of the, great question. Um, I think one of the biggest dangers, um, let me start by saying this. Unfortunately, I used to be very much like anti any geoengineering solution um, because I was like, hey, how about we just stop it emitting carbon in the first place? <laughs> Problem solved. Um, but unfortunately, again, we've re reached this tipping point where we forced ourselves into a corner to think about engineering something. We have to engineer something to do this. And people are looking to the ocean because aside from the physical planet itself, the ocean is the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. So it's super efficient at taking up carbon as you know we saw in the first few slides, 30% is already going into the ocean without us even touching it. Um, in addition, 90% of the heat that we would have been experiencing from global climate change is also being taken up by the ocean. So the ocean is really saving our tuchuses here. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I think your question is really important. And this is why I think, you know, it's really, it's, it's really critical that we evaluate these natural solutions in addition to geoengineering, because the scale of the problem is so grand, right? There isn't going to be this like, one solution that fixes everything. Um, and through an equity perspective, not one solution is going to work for all people on the planet and all communities. And so really thinking about localized solutions, I think is, is really important too. Um, but more to your question about like what the dangers are, most of them are organismal, right? Organisms living in seawater. It's like if someone came and changed the composition of our, our air, right? Um, who knows how that would impact us as organisms? And it's the same for organisms in the ocean. And so a lot of the work is trying to catch up with these geoengineering solutions to look at, you know, what does this mean for different organisms in different environments if we completely change the chemistry of their surrounding water? Um, and I think one really good example of where we've done this and and failed uh, is uh through an uh, experiment that was done in place, so in the ocean, iron fertilization. So essentially, just like you would fertilize your garden to help things grow, um, we can sprinkle iron on the ocean and all of the organisms living there can grow faster and take up more carbon from the atmosphere. And they did these experiments and they worked. It took, you know, they created a huge bloom of organisms that were actively taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Unfortunately, those organisms happen to be toxic dinoflagellates um, <laughs> uh, that uh, were, yes, photosynthesizing and taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but also creating uh, critically toxic environments for other organisms living nearby. Uh, and so this is just, I, I think that's a prime example of, of exactly what you said, where it's almost like the start to a bad sci-fi movie, right? Where, <laughs> um, you know, we can engineer our way out of this, but without really knowing what the consequences are, are we just creating a new problem uh, in exchange for, for an old one? Yeah, in a new problem that if what you were kind of saying is is like not who it's likely going to be a problem for is probably fairly predictable in terms of low-income marginalized communities 
Exactly. Yeah. Because we know those communities also rely, tend to rely the most on ocean resources. So fish is a great example. Um, there was that movie, I forget what it was called. This is a part you should probably edit out. But <laughs> there was a movie that essentially was talking about fishing and saying like how terrible it was and uh, fish like oh, what's it called? I don't remember. But I mean, it was very uh, biased to folks who don't rely on fish as their primary source of protein, which we know are, you know, uh, millions of people around the world. And so, again, thinking about solutions that are not only um, appropriate at scale, but also appropriate for the communities that they might be impacting is something that I think needs to catch up with the desire to, to geoengineer these solutions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Alisa. So any more questions? Any question? Well, I think that we are done then. Thank you, <laughs> Lisa. This was a great, great talk and the service that you do to community is also admirable. And thank you for the discussion. Thank, uh, you. thank you. See you soon. Thanks, everybody.